Hi everyone, um, this is Deanna Santiago and I will be facilitating um, the webinar Basic Rights in Special Education. Uh, I just want to give maybe two more minutes for other people to sign up and then I will be back, but thank you for joining us. Okay, I think we're, re we're ready to get started. Um, so welcome everyone to Basic Rights in Special Education, Parents in the Special Education Process. And this webinar is especially tailored to direct service providers. I am Deanna Santiago, a staff attorney at Mass Advocates for Children, which is also often referred to as MAC. And I'm also here with Shaleen Gupta, who will be taking questions throughout the webinar and kind of facilitating behind the scenes. Um, so in a moment, I will turn it over to her to go through some of the logistics relating to the webinar. Um, so just by way of background, uh, MAC is a nonprofit advocacy organization with the mission of improving educational and life opportunities for children through education, legal assistance to individual families, and systemic advocacy through our coalitions and the legislative process. At MAC, we have a project uh, now called Proyecto Acceso a la Educación Especial, which provides outreach, training, and legal advocacy um, to parents in the area of special education, and specifically targeting Latino families. So through Proyecto Acceso, we have a helpline staffed by Spanish-speaking MAC staff and volunteers um, to provide, without charge, information, referrals, and advice to Spanish-speaking families in the areas of special education, school discipline, and bullying in schools. And through Proyecto Acceso, um, we are also able to provide direct case representation to families, um, although our capacity to do that is very limited at that time. So I wanted to explain why I thought it would be useful um, to give this webinar um, for direct service providers. Um, through my work on the helpline, I often get calls from counselors, case managers, and social workers who are looking for advice related to their clients or their patients on special education matters. Um, and I've seen um, from doing that that many of you are very strong advocates for your clients um, because of your knowledge um, and your training and also you know that you're a great source of support um, as parents advocate to get the services that their children need. Um, so MAC staff 
can only go to team meetings on a very limited basis also. Um, so we know how much parents often rely on your support. Um, and that even if you aren't a lawyer or an experienced special education advocate, um, that even your presence at team meetings can make a difference um, to increase the likelihood that school districts are following the law and involving parents throughout the special education process. Um, and of course, that many of you, especially those you know who are contacting the Proyecto Acceso Helpline, are also bilingual, which is you know we see, which I know is a huge um, asset. Um, you know, among the families that we work with. So I'm going to turn it over now to Shaleen um, to give, um, to talk about logistics. Hello everyone and welcome. Just a couple of things to keep note of. First of all, we have three handouts which you can download. They're available if you look at the menu bar for the webinar. There should be a bar for polls and right underneath it, questions. Just hit that and if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please send them to me, and then when Deanna breaks for questions, I'll read them to her. I'm oh, sorry, that was handouts, so just you can download the handouts, and then above that, if you have any questions, you can send them over, and I will read them out loud to Deanna when she breaks for questions. And at the very end, we'll have a survey. Please fill that out. We take those surveys very seriously and use them to improve our webinar. Thank you. Okay, and I also just wanted to mention that later um, in the winter or early spring that I will also be doing a uh, free parent webinar in Spanish on basic rights and opportunities for parent participation in the special education process, um, which will have a similar focus um, to this webinar, um, you know, including, you know, overcoming linguistic and cultural barriers to advocating for what children need in special education. So I hope also that if you find this webinar to be useful, um, that you, you know, you'll all be included on the, um, you know, the invitation to that webinar. And I hope that you will also help spread the word um, to Spanish-speaking clients and patients that, that you're working with. Um, okay, so I think we'll get started. <coughs> Um, so this is an overview um, of the workshop divided into steps that represent the special education process. Uh, so first I'll be talking about step one, um, which are evaluations, including both school and independent expert evaluations. Moving on to step two of the process, which is the team meeting. And finally, step three, um, which is the IEP, or the Individualized Education Plan, um, which is the written document that outlines the services that children in special education um, receive. I'll also be talking very briefly about options for parents who, after going through all of these steps, continue to disagree with the school district. Um, so throughout all of these steps, I will focus on the important role of parents, um, for their children to access the services that they need um, and opportunities for them to participate throughout the process. I also have three scenarios during the workshop um, that are intended to encourage you to apply the information um, that, that I discussed to real life situations that you may also encounter in your work with parents. Um, so please be looking out for these. Um, I also included the scenarios among your handouts, so if you want to look at those in advance um, before we get to them, um, then you're more than welcome to do that. Okay, the goals of the workshop are to learn how special education laws can help children get needed services and to learn tools that parents can use to be part of the special education process. And finally, um, to understand when to contact the MAC helpline, which I've, um, I've listed here. Um, special education is a complex area of the law, and there's no way that we would be able to cover everything in detail in one webinar. Um, so that's another reason throughout the webinar I may again mention um, that you're welcome to contact the MAC helpline um, if you have questions 
to know about specific um, cases that you're working with in, in certain areas because that, that's always an option. Okay, there are two laws that govern special education. Uh, the federal law, the IDEA, and the state law, which is commonly referred to as Chapter 766. And almost everything that I talk about um, in this workshop stems from these two laws. Okay, I shouldn't have to say this, um, but I always do. Um, the parents are important um, in the special education process. As we all know, um, parents know their children best. Um, they also offer a unique perspective that, um, that school staff often do not have on their children. The law says um, that parents are equal team members, that all written letters, forms, evaluation reports must be in the parent's primary language. The law also says that all meetings must be in the parent's primary language through an interpreter if necessary. And the special education process, as outlined in the law, requires parental consent at certain key points um, before being able to proceed. So unfortunately, you know, this isn't just me saying it. It is, it is recognized in the law. However, although the law recognizes this, it doesn't always play out in practice, as many of you, I'm sure, have seen firsthand. Um, one thing we do know is that uh, children whose parents are involved in the process um, and are actively advocating for what their children need um, tend to be prioritized by school districts throughout the special education process. Okay, so this is to emphasize um, when a parent's primary language is not English, um, trained interpreters are uh, required at all team meetings. And the earlier this calendar year, um, the Federal Department of Justice and Department of Education issued a joint fact sheet, which I've included in your handout, that outlines school districts' obligations to limited English proficient parents in the special education process. Um, and I've included a quote here that school districts should ensure that interpreters and translators have knowledge in both languages of any specialized terms or concepts to be used in the communication at issue and are trained in the role of the interpreter and translator, the ethics of interpreting and translating, and the need to maintain confidentiality. It is not sufficient for the staff merely to be bilingual. And something that we commonly see um, during team meetings is that the school district will pull in a staff person who is not trained, who may be bilingual, um, but is not trained in the role of the interpreter, does not necessarily know um, the terminology that we use in special education, and that is not sufficient. Um, the interpreter should be trained and therefore should understand that their role is to support the parent in participating in that meeting as to the same extent as anybody else in that meeting. Um, and also just to reiterate, all IEPs, the written document outlining the child's educational program, evaluations and school notices must be in the parent's primary language. And if you've seen um, that this is not happening, um, when working with, with one of your clients. At the end of the presentation, I've included some resources, including, of course, the, the MAC helpline. Um, and Tere Ramos is a staff attorney who focuses on language access issues at MAC Law Reform Institute, and she can also be um, a very valuable um, support um, that you're more than welcome to contact. Okay, so this is the special education process and timeline, which I will break down throughout this workshop. Um, the first step is the referral for an evaluation, the second step being the team meeting, and the third step, which is the receipt of the written edu uh, individualized education plan and the parent's response to the IEP. 
So after a child is found eligible for special education, the school district should initiate evaluations every three years. The team meeting to discuss the student's educational progress and service. Services should happen at least once every school year. It could be that it happens more than once during the school year if the parents or school staff have some concern about that child um, that they feel you know, is a reason to convene the team. So timelines that are included in this chart are a very important tool for parents. Um, as they are advocating for their children. So these, these timelines ensure that school districts respond without delay when a referral is made um, and a child may need services. So as you all know, uh, timely and appropriate services really matter to children's development and opportunities. So they, they um, make it so that school districts can't delay um, the process of evaluating children um, regardless of you know what they have to do, you know if they don't have an evaluator um, who's readily available, they need to take steps to find an evaluator who can evaluate the child within these time frames. That's just to give one example. Um, so again, throughout the presentation, I'll, I'll continue to break down these steps. Okay, so to talk about step one, um, the the evaluations and and the referral for an evaluation. So this is the first step to accessing services or making changes in services um, for a student in special education. Anyone, essentially, who has knowledge about a child can make a referral for special education. So this could be a parent. This could be a pediatrician. I'm sure that many of you um, have made referrals for special education or perhaps suggested to parents that they refer their child um, for special education services. Um, but really, it can be any person. And, and if somebody does um, make a referral, then the school is obligated to respond within five school days by providing a consent form to the parent. Um, and so this is a key area where the parent role is, is crucial. Um, they, the school district cannot proceed in conducting an evaluation until they have the parent's consent um, to complete that evaluation. Okay, so there are several different types of evaluations, um, including the required assessments, which are educational, um, those related to a child's disability, um, just to give one example of that might be um, that a speech and language evaluation may be necessary for children with um, a communication impairment or autism. Um, I often suggest um, to parents of children with a disability that affects speech um, to also request an assistive technology evaluation, um, as many school districts won't initiate this otherwise. Um, and then finally, if the parent requests it, um, the school district is obligated to do a psychological home or health assessment. I also like to mention functional behavioral assessments because I often receive calls to our helpline from parents who are concerned that their child is, um, has behavioral issues at school, uh, perhaps is not is refusing to go to school. So any type of behavior that is impacting that student's ability to learn and make progress in school may be a reason um, to request that the school conduct a functional behavioral assessment to get to the bottom of that so that that child can begin to receive services that will allow them to learn and continue to make progress in school. Transition and, voc and functional vocational assessments are um, required for every child in special education when they turn 14 and they enter the period of transition, which I'll, I'll talk about very briefly later on um, in, in the, this workshop. And uh, these, these assessments should take into account that child's strengths, interests, and needs um, as they, as they um, relate to independent living um, and vocation or education after high school. And then finally, I also mention observation 
Um, and actually, I often ask parents to contact our helpline if they have concerns about the programming and services that their child is receiving in school, that they ask um, the counselor um, or social worker or another professional that's also involved with the family whether they would be willing to go to the school to observe that child in the school setting. Um, so is someone familiar with the child outside of the school environment, your insight and documentation of that insight um, can be really useful for parents who are seeking changes or even just clarification about the special education services that their children are receiving. Um, and so the observation um, can be conducted by, you know, in addition to professionals like yourselves, parents, um, education consultants um, that are, it may need to be paid um, unless they're willing to do it on a pro bono basis, on a pro bono basis. Um, and they tend to look at the child's progress in the current program as well as the program's ability um, to enable the child to make effective progress in school. So, you know, the evaluations are really the basis for determining the services that a child receives. And so the question that I often get at this point is, well, you know, what if the parent disagrees um, with the school evaluation? What are their options at this point? And this is another area where parents have a very useful tool in the law um, in advocating and obtaining the services that their children need in school. Um, so the remedy if a parent disagrees with the school evaluation is to obtain an independent expert evaluation. And many um, insurance uh, providers, you know, can, will cover the cost of an independent evaluation. Um, you know, parents should definitely check to be sure that they will cover the full amount, you know, the full amount of that evaluation. So that's one option if they want to do it completely independent of the school district. But another option is to request that the school district fund the independent evaluation in any area that they where they disagree with school evaluation. So it may be that the school goes through the process, they've conducted the evaluation, and um, the evaluation may be too vague to be useful. Maybe it doesn't include any recommendations. Or, you know, I, I've been receiving a lot of calls to the helpline from parents who, where the school district is saying that they don't feel that the child um, require special education services anymore, and here are their evaluations that they've conducted, you know, to show that that child um, doesn't require um, additional special education services. So they're, they're proposing to terminate that child's eligibility for special education. So that's another case where I, I always suggest to the parent you need to get an independent expert evaluation to show that your child does have a disability that's impacting their ability to make progress in school and, um, and to make recommendations on what services their child needs. So there are two paths for parents um, in obtaining a school district funding for independent evaluation. The first option um, is, is using a uh, sliding fee scale. So using this, and this is within 16 months of um, the completion of the school district evaluation. So if the school, if the student is eligible for free or reduced lunch, then the school district must pay for this, must agree to pay for this independent evaluation um, without asking the parent for additional um, income documentation. Um, if the child is not eligible for free or reduced lunch, then um, the parent may be required to share some financial information. Um, and that information is confidential and be, will be returned to the family. And you know, by sliding fee scale, it's important to note that the school, using the scale um, in the, the regulations, that school districts pay for 100% for a family of four with an income up to 400% of the poverty level, which is over $95,000. So, you know, for 
the majority of families, um, even if they aren't, you know, very low income, the school district is still obligated to fund um, the entire independent evaluation. And at MAC, we have a, if, if you contact the helpline or have parents contact the helpline, we have sample letters. Um, actually, they're also posted on our, on our website um, for requesting an independent evaluation. Uh, and if you contact the helpline, um, we also have a, a list of evaluators um, that, we, that we commonly refer parents to um, that they can that they can make um, arrangements with for this. Um, and um, so then there's also, I should also mention the second option here, where the parent chooses not to provide financial information. They request that the school district fund the independent evaluation. And using this option, within five days, the school district must either agree to pay for the evaluation or initiate a hearing with the Bureau of Special Education appeal. So this brings us to our first scenario. Um, so I'm going to read the scenario, and if you have any idea about what this, how this parent might proceed, I would encourage you to um, write in your answers to the comment section, or the question section. So Eliane is 10 years old and has autism and ADHD. He has an IEP, but for the last two years, he has been getting Ds and Fs in most of his classes. His last school evaluation was two years ago. He had to repeat the fourth grade already and is in danger of having to repeat it a second time. He has also started to argue more with his teachers and to lose interest in class. His mother, Eva, knows that something needs to change and thinks that his teachers and the school should be doing more. What should she do? So I'm going to leave just about a minute for people to write in any answers, any suggestions about what she should do, and then um, I'll give my ideas and, and your responses. Okay, so we have one um, response to this, um, which is to request an unscheduled team meeting, which, oh, we have another one. Actually, we've got several. Oh, we have several. Um, so, at, yes, ask for a, a meeting with the school. Um, request an IEP meeting. And ask to, for an initial evaluation if needed. Okay, so those are all great suggestions. Um, and here we have, yes, request an, an unscheduled team meeting. So the parent does not need to wait until the yearly team meeting um, if they have concerns before that point about their child's progress in school. Um, request in writing that the school do an evaluation. Um, request an independent evaluation. Um, and I also, I often suggest um, to parents that they always write down whenever they talk to anyone at school, um, just, it, you know, email is always great. Not all of the parents that we work with are on email. Um, however, so even, even a notebook with, you know, the, the date and the name of the person they spoke with and the content of that conversation, um, you know, is really helpful, and if they receive any documents from the school, especially we see this with school discipline, you know, they don't have to have a fancy file system, but, you know, even if they have a, a basket or a bag, you know, for just keeping everything together, that can be really helpful, especially, if, you know, if they're working with you or they end up contacting the helpline and, and I've asked to review documents, that can be really helpful. Um, so those would be the suggestions. Um, in this case. Okay, so now we're going to stop for questions. 
And if you haven't already, please do send some questions through the question bar. So first off, question. Could you talk more about what a functional behavioral assessment contains relative to a psychological assessment? Okay. Um, okay. I think, so my understanding, and I'm not, you know, a psychologist or, or an evaluator in any form, but just based on um, what I've seen, um, the functional behavioral assessment will focus more on a specific behavior or set of behaviors, you know, that are, that are interfering with that child's ability to learn. Um, so they may include some components that would be similar to a psychological evaluation, but, um, but it may be more focused on, you know, some specific behaviors that um, people are noticing, you know, within that child and, and how those specific behaviors are impacting um, the child's ability to learn. Um, but if you have, you know, more questions about that, feel free to let, you know, to contact me after the webinar by email um, and I can get back to you. But I don't have a lot of expertise in that area. So we had an experience with a low-income parent who requested an independent evaluation within 16 months because their child was refusing to go to school due to behavioral issues, et cetera. The school denied the request saying that the evaluations they did were complete and sufficient. Is that a common tactic? It may be a common tactic. Um, it's, it's from just based on the information that you're giving here. It's, it's not legal, um, and you know, and it's, I'm really glad that who, you know whoever wrote that question that you were involved because I think that some school districts, um, you know, often use that tactic and maybe similar tactics um, to avoid doing the evaluation just you know because parents don't always know their rights um, and and will accept that. So if that's something that you see. And you know, I would I would definitely suggest you know following up with the school in writing and uh, getting something, getting a denial in writing from them would be great. And you're more than welcome to contact the helpline, and we can talk through kind of the specifics about that. But it sounds just based on that information that that's that's illegal. And that's all we had in terms of questions. Please keep them coming because Deanna will be breaking again for more. Okay, okay, thanks everyone. Um, okay, so now uh, we'll be moving on to step two, which is uh, the team meeting. Um, and so I think that we kind of have a range of, uh, you know, different of people, you know, who are on this webinar in terms of, you know, some of you may have never been to a team meeting and some of you perhaps have been to hundreds of team meetings. Um, but so at this point, at the point where the team meeting happens um, during the regular special education process um, is, you know, the referral has been made for an evaluation and the evaluation has been complete, completed um, within 30 school days of parent consent. And so um, the team meeting um, is convened um, to talk about um, the findings from those evaluations. Um, there are a few other purposes of the team meeting. Um, we had we had talked earlier in the scenario where you know the parent had specific concerns about their her child's progress in school. That's a, a reason to convene an unscheduled team meeting. So that's that's one other can be another purpose of a team meeting. Um, but one is as we said to discuss evaluations. Um, this can be school evaluations, or you know if the parent has requested an independent evaluation. Um, the district is required to convene the team within 10 school days of, of receiving that independent evaluation. Um, purpose can be to decide if the child is eligible for special education, and there are three questions um, that they are required to address during that meeting to make that determination, um, whether the child has a disability, um, if the student is unable to progress effectively in regular education due to that disability, um, and whether that student requires special education services. Um, team meetings are also should be held automatically once a year um, at the point when their child's IEP is set to expire to assess 
you know, that child's progress with those services that are included in the IEP um, and whether there are any changes that should be made to the IEP. Um, and just that the team is also required um, to address certain issues um, specific to children that have autism. Okay, so these are all the people that should be at the team meeting. Um, I'm not going to go into detail, you know, list out all these people, but the thing that I just wanted to note that um, I'm sure that, that you all have experienced, or many of you have experienced, is that it, because of the number of people at these meetings, um, it can be really overwhelming and intimidating for parents, and which is just another reason why, you know, you, you all, you know, can be such so useful, you know, to parents, so valid, such a valuable support to parents in this process. Um, you know, just having someone there that they know and that they know is kind of, you know, on their side um, can be just really helpful in what can be a, a very emotional experience for parents um, because they are they're talking about their child after all. Okay, so in terms of preparing for the team meeting. Um, you know, these are these are just some some ideas. I'm sure that you all have. If you have others that you want to write in, um, you know, you're more than welcome. But something I always suggest is that um, the parent requests the written evaluation reports before the meeting. And if they do this in writing, then the law requires that the school district provide the written evaluations at least two days in advance of the team meeting so that the parent can review those um, in advance of the meeting, can take them to, you know, any other outside service providers they're working with, um, fam even family members, you know, but they can review and know, you know, generally, you know, what, what those evaluations say before the meeting. Um, the parent can invite an advocate, service provider, or a friend to the meeting. Again, this person um, can be there to provide support. During that meeting, um, take notes, um, provide their input on the child, and even if they don't say a thing during the meeting afterwards, um, you know, to, for there to be someone that the parent can talk to just about what happened at that meeting, because there's just so much content, um, and as I mentioned earlier, it can be a really emotional uh, process for parents. And so to have that extra support can be hugely valuable. I always suggest that parents write down their concerns and questions in advance of the meeting because it can be overwhelming. And it's, it's and these meetings, you know, as many of you know, there's a ton to get through in a short amount of time. And um, the parent isn't generally the one driving the, the agenda at the meeting. So if they write that down in advance, they can kind of um, just make sure that their concerns are addressed um, and that their questions are answered. <coughs> and finally, another suggestion um, is to make sure that the school will have a trained interpreter um, at the meeting in advance. So I'm going to stop again the question. Sure. So first question. Um, there are certain assessments that are always part of an evaluation and that are required based on parent requests, you know, psychological, home, health. But is the school also required to conduct the other assessments listed if requested by the parent, such as, you know, adaptive tests? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, and I'm, thank you for asking this question so I can, I can make that very clear. <coughs> Um, if if a referral is made um, for you know on behalf of a child to receive services, um, there's kind of that core set of evaluations that the school is required to provide. However, um, if the parent or another service provider requests um, a an evaluation in an area specific to a concern they have about that child, so maybe yes the technology, if the school hasn't initiated that, um, you know, physical therapy, occupational therapy, you know, they're very common areas in which um, school districts are, are asked to evaluate children. So um, they are required to respond when they receive that request for an evaluation. 
Um, so definitely, if that isn't happening, then then I would encourage you or, or have you know to contact the helpline or have the parent do that. Can the parent request a different interpreter than the one the school provides? Um, so yeah, so I, I I hear this a lot from people where they they feel like um, you know the interpreter is is either not you know not unbiased um, or they're just not comfortable or they just feel it's a poor interpreter. Um, parents should definitely make that request, and I I suggest documenting you know why they're making that request, um, and it it may require you know going to maybe even filing a complaint with the State Department of Ed if the school isn't changing, kind of refusing to provide a different interpreter. But the parent can absolutely make that request. Um, and, you know, whether the school district immediately is going to, you know, provide another interpreter is another issue, but I would absolutely encourage them to request. And, and just to keep a record of the requests made and, um, and why they are requesting a different interpreter. And then lastly, we had a scenario where we just looked at perspectives, thought there was a student who was not progressing as expected. Um, the parent requested a new evaluation and ended up having to wait three years. So their student went from first to third grade. The child has CBI and the school has not addressed any issues. No TBI has been assigned. They're not utilizing visual assistance equipment. The parent has been told, has had to research these issues, and we're waiting for a new team meeting. OK, so just to, just to get at the beginning of the question, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, you know, this, if they, the parent requested the evaluation, they shouldn't have had to wait three years for another mm -hmm. evaluation. I don't know why that happened, but that should not have happened <clears throat> if the parent made the request. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of other issues here that I'm, I'm thinking I maybe can talk to you about after the webinar. Um, because just because I may have other questions, and it's, it's pretty in-depth. But I can... Um, it sounds like this is an involved scenario. So the best thing to do is to email Diana at bsantiago at mathadvocates.org. And please keep your questions coming in as we proceed, because Deanna will be breaking one more time. OK, thank you. I do think that's the best way to, to handle that particular question. Is there any more? OK, so the referral has made, been made for an evaluation. The evaluation um, has been completed, or set of evaluations has been completed. The team meeting has been held. And so we're going to move on to step three, um, which is the IEP, or the Individualized Education Plan. Um, and this is the essentially the contract um, of the services that the school district is prepared to provide um, to students who are receiving special education services. Um, so it's a really important document. It's, it's crucial to making sure that schools provide um, the services that children need to be able to make progress in school. The, the IEP must consider um, not only the academic needs of the student, um, but also the developmental and the functional needs of that student. Um, so it, it covers a lot, and, um, and it's really it's, it's an extremely important document um, in this process. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about understanding the IEP itself and, and also options for parents in responding to the IEP. Um, <clears throat> and this is just, the, these are the um, components of the IEP. Um, I, it, I could, I would need probably 10 or 15 trainings to be able to cover, um, you know, each of these in depth. So I'm going to focus on the areas in which parents um, have you know, a, opportunities really to have have input into the IEP and and where you know useful tools for parents in understanding the IEP. Um, so while it's important for parents to understand all of the IEP, um, but there are certain areas where they can 
um, where they can have uh, particular input. So the, the first of those areas is the uh, parent student parent or student concerns, um, which is an actual section of the IEP. And um, this is where parents, where the school district is obligated to document parent concerns specifically. Um, so this section is for parent input only. And parents can write whatever they want in this section. Um, so, you know, they can even, I even sometimes suggest you know, if the parent feels better, you know, bringing to the team meeting um, a paragraph of what they want to be included in the parent concerns. Um, but, you know, regardless of whether they do that, they should definitely be thinking in advance of the team meeting of what concerns they want to raise during the team meeting for that, that discussion. Their concerns can be academic, social, or emotional. Um, they can be concerns about <coughs> um, what they are seeing, you know, at school or think is happening at school or they can be, you know, related to what they're seeing at home with their child. Um, so while, you know, showing their, con indicating their concerns in this section doesn't necessarily mean that their child will just, you know, instantly receive services to address those concerns, um, this documentation gives the school district notice that the parent has specific worries. Um, and when developing the student's IEP, the district must ensure that there is this parent participation um, and must consider their input about special education concerns. And, and just to give an example <coughs> where, it's, where it's been in, in a case that I had, um, the parent, uh, you know, this was a student who, um, who was largely nonverbal and um, had been using an assistive technology communication device and the mother didn't feel that the school was, was consistently implementing that device and in fact the student was not able to use it outside of the school environment at all. So um, two years prior to when I had even seen you know any of the IEPs for this student, the student, the mother had raised this at a team meeting that she was concerned that you know the, the device was not being consistently implemented and her daughter didn't know how to use it at home. Um, and then when I got involved in the case about um, two years after that, this you know I was reviewing the the prior IEPs and I saw this and the school district still wasn't consistently implementing the the device. Um, and so we were able to raise that and um, able to obtain some comp compensatory services um, because, you know, the, the, it was, had been documented that, that the student needed that to be able to make progress in school and it wasn't happening. <laughs> so that's just one example where um, it can just be really useful to document for the parent, you know, to have that official documentation. Um, Another area, the parent or student vision. I always ask parents, you know, what what do you want for your child in the next year, the next five years? And and by this, you know, we don't mean, you know, especially for the older students, you know, or transition age, you know, what what agencies they're going to be, you know, um, you know, serviced by, you know, after school. It's a pet peeve of mine when I see that, you know, they're going to be. Um, in the vision, you know, that they're going to be um, a DDS client or whatever the case might be. It should really focus on, um, you know, what what that student wants in life um, and what they want what they want to aim for. Um, and I always think, you know, in the next whether and it could be related to, you know, their academics or it could be related to, you know, what they want to be able to do in terms of taking care of themselves. Um, or, you know, working at a job. I mean, it's so individual to the student, um, but that's something that a parent should also always be thinking about um, in advance of the team meeting or in the case where the student is old enough where they can also have input. Um, and just another, so I always talk about the, um, the service delivery grid is another um, really useful tool, I find, for advocates um, and you know, anyone and parents also just in understanding the services that their child is receiving or should be receiving in school. Um, and 
the, it includes, um, here on this slide you'll see just a, a blank service delivery grid um, where it, it shows the type of service that the school is obligated to provide, who is required to provide it, um, how often, and, um, and what goal that service is um, intended to address. And it, it also includes the setting in which the student is required to receive those services. So a useful <coughs> tool that I often suggest to parents also is that um, they can, when they receive the IEP after the team meeting, um, so it's the proposed IEP, it hasn't been, um, it's not being implemented yet, um, and the parent is being asked to respond, <coughs> they can compare that proposed IEP with the last accepted IEP, um, which should include the services that the student is currently receiving. And that way they can really determine, um, you know, you can get a sense not only, you know, of, of the services that any changes in the services. Sometimes school districts, like they should be talking about um, any changes that they are going to be making to the IEP during the team meeting. All of those, any changes are should really be a team decision and so they should be discussed at the team meeting. It doesn't always happen, um, however. So the parent can see if there's been any reduction in services or, you know, if, if a, um, a speech and language um, pathologist has been replaced with an aid to provide a certain service or, you know, what, whatever the case might be. It's, it's a useful tool and kind of a summary of all the services that, that the student should be receiving. Um, and just in terms of the services, I just want to, you know, emphasize again, you know, what determines the services that a student should be receiving are really the evaluation, both the school evaluation and the independent evaluation. And of course, you know, throughout the team process, teachers and other um, members of the team can, can also, and the, and the parents, based on what they're seeing, especially at home, can make suggestions about, you know, additional services or different services. Um, but really, I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of the evaluation um, and comparing, you know, those evaluations is, is just one example. Of course, you know, the parent could compare, you know, any. I had a call recently to the helpline, this was outside of the service delivery grid, where the school district in their proposed IEP, which which was in the parent's primary language, so it had it had been translated but it didn't include door-to-door um, -door transportation for that student. And that's a team decision. If, if the school district is no longer going to be providing any service, um, you know, it, that, that needs to be discussed with the team um, in advance. Well, the parent, I mean, if any of you have, have um, you know, worked with, with IEPs, it won't be surprising that the parent didn't notice that that service had been eliminated um, just because it's, it's a complex document and didn't know that it had been eliminated until the bus didn't come for her son. And um, so because it hadn't been discussed as a team um, and the mother, you know, yes, she had she accepted the IEP um, in full, but because it hadn't been addressed as a team, she withdrew her acceptance and requested another team meeting, and the school district was had to had to um, continue providing transportation until you know an ultimate decision was made on that. So that's just another example. So just comparing you know IEPs can be it can be really helpful. Um, so these are the IEP transition requirements. There are two periods of transition um, during the special education process. The first is for children who turn three and have been receiving early intervention services. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind at this period of transition um, into special education is that before the child's third birthday, <coughs> the school district must provide um, the IEP and services if the child is determined to be eligible for special education. And that determination is made through the evaluation process. So they, they must have evaluated the child before their third birthday. The second period of transition is when, <clears throat> for children in special education, when they turn 14, um, and 
at this point, as I mentioned earlier, the school district should initiate a transition assessment um, to determine that child's strengths, um, preferences, and their needs um, as related to post-secondary education and vocation and independent living. Um, it should, the school at, third, at this period of transition um, should be providing services at school and in the community. So especially for children, um, for students who are older in this process, you know, 16, 17, um, and for students past 18, if they're still receiving special education services, they should be um, in the community receiving services. Um, and the goal, you know, is, is to prepare the student, these services is to prepare the student for work, higher education, and independent living after high school. And at, at age 14, the student should be invited um, to the team meeting. And on Mac's website, we have additional resources on transition, um, including a webinar that's focused on, on the transition process. Okay, and placement. Um, this is actually kind of separate from the IEP. There's a separate placement form. Um, but important things to note are that placement is a decision that's made by the IEP team. Um, the team can only consider the unique needs of the child in determining placement or any services that the child um, is receiving. So they're not supposed to consider costs um, or whether they have the available staff um, to be able to provide a service. It should be really focused only on the unique needs of the child. Um, and if, if you're at a team meeting with a parent and, you know, this, this happens often, um, you know, where they, they start talking about, well, we, we don't have the, that in the budget or, um, or oh, our, our speech therapist is, is going to be on maternity leave or, you know, so we can't, we can't provide that. You know, that's, that's illegal. <laughs> they should not be, um, they, they have to work around those considerations of cost and, you know, available personnel. And so if you're at a team meeting and you hear those kinds of things, you know, it's, it's useful to document it. Um, just write it down. Um, you could ask them if in the, um, they should be submitting, it's called the N1 form that's attached to the IEP after the team meeting, um, where they report on any, you know, rejected Option, rejection, uh, rejected services um, <clears throat> during the meeting, um, you know, you could ask them to just put the reason, you know, in that, that part of the IEP, um, but really, so, you know, they can only consider the unique needs of the child. And just that there are many placement types that, that range depending on the needs of the student um, from full inclusion. Um, which is the least restrictive setting for students where they are in a classroom with non-disabled peers with some um, additional support outlined in their IEP to residential, which is the, the, is the extreme, it's the most restrictive setting where, where a student is at their school um, 24 hours a day. Um, and the law prefers that students with disabilities learn in the least restrictive environment um, that they can, where they can make progress. Uh, so that's, that's always something that is weighed in the determination of, of the student's placement. <coughs> okay, so um, parent response to the IEP. Parent has three options in responding to the IEP. Um, they can fully accept the IEP which means that they agree with all of the services um, and accommodations that the school is providing for their child. They don't think that their child needs anything less or anything more. Um, and so they should just find and they can fully accept that IEP. Um, <coughs> another option um, for parents is to fully reject the IEP, um, which means um, that um, they don't agree with any of the services that are included in the IEP. 
um, the effect of a, a full rejection to the IEP is that it kind of reverts back to the last accepted IEP. Um, but, you know, the potential that it that if the parent fully rejects the IEP, it could delay implementation of services for that child. <coughs> um, so we don't, unless the parent feels that their child should not be receiving special education services, I don't generally suggest that they fully reject the IEP. And the most common, in at least in my cases, you know, as an attorney for parents, is to partially reject um, the IEP. <coughs> Um, and also in partially rejecting the IEP, the parent is agreeing that their child does require special education services, but they may think that their child needs more of some service or a different service than what is included in the IEP. So they can accept the services being provided, but then just specify um, either in the document itself, there's some uh, lines that they can use to um, outline the areas that they are rejecting for the IEP, or they can attach a letter to the IEP with their outlining their partial rejection. <coughs> so I'm going to move on to the second scenario. Um, so Juan Carlos is six years old. He has Down syndrome. He's been receiving occupational therapy as part of his IEP for two years. At his team meeting, the facilitator says that they don't think he needs OT. Juan Carlos's mother, Carmen, disagrees. Juan Carlos's pediatrician said that OT was still important, even though he was making slow progress. After the team meeting, Carmen receives the IEP in Spanish. She notices in the service delivery grid that OT is not included. What should she do? And I'll just give a minute um, for people to write in. Okay, so we're going to review some of the responses. So we're getting a consensus that you should partially reject the IEP. And then um, write a document or a letter that she wants to continue to advocate for OT services. Okay, and that that's an excellent suggestion. That's exactly what I would do. Um, partially reject the IEP and, and <clears throat> just be clear why that she's um, rejecting the elimination of, of occupational therapy um, in the IEP. <clears throat> and this highlights a really important right that parents have in special education, which is referred to as the right to stay put, where <clears throat> a school district cannot eliminate a service or accommodation that's in a student's IEP without parent consent or if the parent does not consent um, without going to a hearing um, before the Bureau of Special Education appeals um, and having a hearing officer decide um, whether or not the student continues to need that service. So in a lot of cases, if it's isolated to one service, for example, the school, may, the school district may not even go um, you know, through that process. If the parent partially rejects the IEP and requests that OT continue, um, I mean, she doesn't even have to make that explicit request, but you know, she can 
um, reject that elimination of OT, um, then she can, she'll be exercising her right to stay put and they need to continue providing that service. Um, in the meantime, of course, she should be, <clears throat> once she does that, in case the school district does um, take the matter to hearing, she should be gathering um, support from outside service providers, maybe get an independent OT evaluation um, to support that her son's continued need for OT. Um, but, you know, as, as a kind of interim measure that may end up being kind of a permanent measure, um, just because the school may not bother, you know, taking it to hearing, she should she should partially reject the IEP. And um, if if it would be helpful, um, <coughs> we uh, she she could contact or you on her behalf could contact Max Helpline um, for a sample partial rejection letter. Okay, and then scenario three. Maria is 16 years old. She has Asperger's syndrome. She gets good grades with some classroom supports and tutoring. <clears throat> Outside of school, though, she's not able to go places on her own because she does not know how to ask for help if something goes wrong. Three weeks ago, she was at the train station and didn't have enough money to buy a pass to get home. When she was an hour late, her mother, Luisa, went to school and the train station and found her sitting there alone and afraid. Her parents, Luisa and Manuel, are worried about how Maria will function at work after high school or in college. Excuse me, how she will function at work after high school or in college. The school is asking them to sign a new IEP, but it doesn't include anything that will prepare Maria for life after high school. So we're going to pause a moment Oops. Um, in case people want to write in just for about one minute. And so the response we're getting is she should not sign it, request it in writing, and ask for life skills training. Okay, and those are all um, good suggestions. <clears throat> so in addition to rejecting, partially rejecting an IEP because of the elimination of services, as in um, the prior scenario, they can reject the IEP um, for not including certain needed services. Um, so, um, so that's what they should do. Um, and they should outline, I think, what was the, that response? They should um, ask for um, independent living skill development mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, this is a transition age student. Um, I mean, travel training is just one example that's highlighted in this scenario of the um, independent living skills that the school district should be developing with a student through her IEP. Um, but they're, you know, the, for transition age students, it can really range um, depending on their, their needs. Um, and so um, they should partially reject the IEP and outline the, <coughs> the independent living and vocational um, and any kind of you know preparation that she will need to function on a college campus, um, you know whatever her kind of um, her trajectory is going to be or could be, um, will determine the services that the school district should be providing, and all of those services should be outlined in the IEP. So, unlike in the prior scenario where we have stay put because the school district is eliminating a service that she has been receiving um, or that that student had been receiving. Um, 
the parent doesn't doesn't have any kind of automatic right, you know, to these services because they are partially rejecting the omission of those services. However, you know, having this outlined in the IEP, um, well, first what it will do is the parent can request a meeting with the team so they can talk more about, you know, what, what she needs related to transition. Um, and then, you know, from that point, depending on the school district's response with whether she's satisfied with it, <clears throat> she can kind of take steps going from there. Um, but what determines transition services, this is, you know, can be as a transition evaluation, um, both that the school conducts and also um, if the parent has sought an independent transition evaluation, um, those can determine transition services. But this is an area, transition is an area where students, where parents, you know, have a really important role because they see, um, you know, outside of school whether the student is um, generalizing the skills that they are learning in school to the home, to the community. Um, and if that isn't happening, then um, the school district <coughs> probably isn't, isn't doing their job. Um, so that's, and you know, if the parent's concerned about that, they should, they should raise that definitely um, with the special education team. Okay, so, um, so any questions at this, at this point? And then we just have a, we're, we're almost done. So a lot of good ones coming up. Oh, good. So first of all, can you just clarify again, what happens if a parent doesn't sign an IEP? Well, if they don't sign an IEP, then the, the school district just continues to implement the existing IEP. So if there have been any additional services that the school district has proposed in the new IEP, um, then they can't implement those services without parent consent. So they will continue to implement the most recent accepted IEP. Now the timelines say parents should receive an IEP within 45 working days, but does that mean the IEP must be in the parent's language within those 45 days? Yeah, the, so the law, um, the law doesn't say one way or another. I mean, you can presume yes, because they are required to comply with those timelines, and then they are required to provide primary language um, uh, you know, languages, you know, all documents in the parent's primary language. Um, so, I mean, my interpretation would be yes, that they have to. It doesn't always happen, you know, because it's, it's an extra step and they may need to send it out for translation or interpretation. Um, and in those cases, it's, you know, it, it, in my, you know, judgment, it, if it's just a question of you know, an extra week um, or even 10 days, then I usually, um, it, it's not enough really to, to go forward with a complaint, um, you know, which will take just that, you know, that amount of time to kind of prepare the complaint. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, a judgment call. Usually what I do is, is I just request to receive it in English um, when it's available in English and then the, in the translated copy just as soon as possible you know, after, after that happens. And now just to clarify, with the three-year-old transition assessment, it seems like that would be prior to that child entering the public school system. So what context could an IEP be developed in when a child is under three? Oh, well, uh, so <clears throat> at age three, um, they, they would be transitioning into the special education system. So they would be <coughs> transitioning from an individualized family service plan, which is what children who are receiving um, early intervention have. It's kind of like the IEP equivalent, very roughly. Um, and then they would be transitioning to an IEP. So um, before age three, they should be assessed, and an IEP should be prepared for when that child turns three, um, so that they're ready to go, you know, in, in their special education program once they turn three. Now, is it common that ADHD is not considered enough 
for a child to be eligible for an IEP or a 504 plan. This is happening a lot with some of my clients. Um, <clears throat> so the diagnosis alone should, doesn't determine eligibility one way or another. Um, the school district, it's just one component. Um, so the school district needs to be looking at um, the impact of the child's disability on their ability to make progress in school. And if the child has ADHD and they're not able to focus at school um, and they're not, you know, they're not learning in school, then yes, yeah, that should be enough um, for that child to receive services that will support their learning in school. Um, but I think the important thing is, you know, the diagnosis alone, regardless of what the diagnosis is, should not be enough one way or another, you know, to determine whether the child needs special education. It's really, you know, the impact of the child's disability on their ability to learn. When it comes to partially rejecting an IEP with stated concerns, what can parents do in the case of insufficient services? particularly services that the school never even offered? So they should definitely document that. Um, so it, I guess um, they, should, they should document what services they, they feel that their child should be receiving as part of the partial rejection, and, and that should be included in the IEP. Um, but they <coughs> will need to, you know, as, as I've said a few times, um, during the webinar, the evaluations are really crucial to backing up, um, you know, the need in a lot of cases for services. So um, the parent, you know, can document that as part of their partial rejection in the IEP, uh, but they should have evaluation support to back that up. So, um, you know, as an attorney, I'm always looking for, you know, the next step after if the team meeting process is, is not successful. The parent doesn't feel that they have achieved, you know, success, um, you know, during the, the team meeting process and just thinking to the next step. So the parent should always have that just based on, um, on experts um, in, in different areas and, and their recommendations for what services the child needs. So the parent should always be, you know, looking, have it, having kind of backup um, for for their um, services that they're requesting, you know, on behalf of their child. And finally, evaluations are required every three years, but how often might an IEP be updated? Well, so the IEP should be updated once a year. Um, and that is, you know, just based on, it could be, um, you know, so the evaluations are crucial to determining what services the child needs, but also, you know, what the child's um, teachers are seeing and other, um, you know, whether it's speech and language pathologists or um, even, you know, adaptive physical education instructors, you know, whatever the case might be, um, you know, what they're seeing in school, <coughs> you know, with related to that child and what the parents are seeing at home you know, also influence, you know, what, what services the child should be receiving. That's all kind of input that's brought to the team to determine the services in addition to the evaluation. So, um, so that it should happen once a year. So even though the evaluations, assuming, you know, things are going pretty smoothly and, and neither the parent or the school district feels there's a need for, you know, additional school evaluations, um, prior to the three years, um, the IEP should be updated every year. So, I mean, the same goals, that's a, another pet peeve. <laughs> when the goals don't change, um, that's kind of a red flag. Um, you know, that, that should definitely be discussed, um, you know, during, during the team meeting. If the parent sees that the goals are unchanged from one IEP to the next, um, then that's an indication that the child you know, they're not making progress in school. So what's going on? What needs to change so that the child can um, can be, you know, continuing to progress in school? Thank you, Deanna. Um, so given that we have 10 more minutes, we'll let Deanna finish the rest of the webinar. And then if we have time for more questions, 
we'll ask the rest of yours to keep them coming. Okay. Um, thanks, Shogun. So um, I'm just. These are just um, options. If after the team meeting process, so the team meeting has been held, the parent has partially rejected um, the IEP, and another team meeting has been held to discuss their partial rejection. And, and after that process, even the parent still disagrees with the school, then there are a few options um, for problem resolution. Um, one of them is to request a mediation through the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. The school district also has to agree to participate in the mediation process. Um, the parent can request a hearing through the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. Um, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education Program Quality Assurance um, can be a uh, useful tool if the, if the school district is not in compliance um, with, with the law in some way. So, um, I mean, translation and interpretation services, you know, they're not provide, they're not following the um, timelines are another example of where PQA um, can be can be useful in getting things moving. Um, and the U.S. Office of, of Civil Rights um, is another forum where parents can go if they feel that their children are being discriminated against um, because of their disability. And all of these options, I suggest that parents contact the MAC helpline. Um, for help, a lot of parents do go through the mediation process without um, an advocate or attorney, um, but, it, but it's really hard for most parents. I mean, the hearings with the Bureau of Special Education Appeals are, are very formal hearings where, you know, evidence is, pre is presented and, um, you know, there's, there's oral testimony and, and the need for um, strong you know, expert support for the parent's position. So I, I in those cases, um, it's, it's, it's important for most parents um, to, to have legal representation. Um, and so, you know, for any of these options, I definitely contact the MAC helpline um, and we can kind of, we can talk through it. Um, and so these are just the takeaway points um, from the webinar. Um, that the law recognizes and we know that children receive better services when parents are involved throughout the process. Primary language interpretation and translation is basic um, for many parents to understand and participate in the special education process. Evaluations determine the services that children receive and parents have the right to request that the district fund independent evaluations. School districts cannot eliminate services from the IEP without parent consent or a decision from a BSBA hearing officer to do so. Um, and finally, that um, that you or you know the parents that you work with are welcome to contact Max Helpline um, for information and advice as needed. So if you don't take anything away from the webinar, I hope that at least those five points um, will stick will stick with you. Um, and um, so I guess we can, if there, are there other questions? That we can, yeah. Work? Okay. Um, so one more question about um, if the child is re referred to a therapeutic school, is that a placement that would be from the IEP? Yes. Um, so it's, it, well, so the, the IAP outlines the services. There's a separate placement page that the parent needs to sign that that talks about the the specific placement for the child. So it's I mean technically it's just it's a separate form, you know, from the IEP. Um, but the IEP would outline the services that the child should be receiving in that placement, if that if that makes any sense. So there's the placement consent form, um, which is which is separate from the IEP. And that, that's where the parent should see, you know, the specific um, setting or, or school, you know, where the child is going to be. Fantastic. Thank you, Deanna. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. And thank you for everything that you do for parents. Um, 
I know I really appreciate, you know, the call from you all and your support for parents. Um, and if you need, I give these um, workshops also live to groups of parents. So if any of you have um, groups in Spanish, I should say. So if you have Spanish-speaking parents that you work with, um, you know, in groups on a regular basis or able to convene a group of parents, um, you know, who are Spanish-speaking and who you think would be interested in receiving this training in person, definitely reach out to me. Um, at dsantiago at massadvocates.org, and um, we can arrange a time for that to happen. Um, but otherwise, yeah, thank you so much um, for participating. And um, if anything comes up, then you know, please contact me by email or or um, or through the helpline. Okay. Bye bye. Oh, and the um, so you will receive an evaluation. It should pop up. Um, at the end of this webinar. So please um, complete the evaluation. It gives me very valuable information about how I can improve the workshop. Um, and it also, you know, a lot of our funders, you know, require that, that we, we receive, uh, that they require some of the information that's included in the evaluation. So um, please do complete that. And um, I look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, everyone.